In this video, we're going to look at the three distribution diagram for one sample means. You are encouraged to compare this diagram to the three sample distribution for one sample proportions, which was discussed in a previous video. A hand-drawn three distribution diagram is required in each of your written reports for each sample mean hypothesis test and for each one sample mean confidence interval. These diagrams help to demonstrate your understanding of the process and it makes it easy for you to create the required R script for the test of the confidence interval. Although we will be talking in general terms, it might be helpful to have some specific examples in mind. So consider these populations. All the fraud complaints in Alaska. The children in a gifted and talented program. Maybe all the women over 50 years old in the United States. Or maybe all the aboriginal prisoners in Australia. Or batteries produced by a company. There's a number of different variables that could be associated with any one of these populations. Suppose that our variable of interest in the fraud complaints in Alaska was the dollar amount of each complaint. Then the average, the mean of those dollar amounts, would be a meaningful parameter. In the case of the children in the accelerated program, maybe we're interested in the height of each child. Or the women over 50 years old in the United States, we might be interested in the number of children that they have. Aboriginal prison prisoners in Australia, we may be interested in the distance from the prisoner to the prisoner's home. The batteries produced by a company did in the life of the battery. In all of these cases, a mean would be a meaningful population parameter because you're going to have to include a hand-drawn three distribution diagram for means in your reports. Let me sketch one here. The underlying situation is that you've got a population with a numerical variable. So therefore it makes sense to talk about the mean of that population. We're going to call the numerical variable x. Let's say the mean is located right there. And of course the population has a standard deviation. This population may or may not be normally distributed. We're going to look at samples of size n. In fact, we're going to look at every sample of size n and calculate the mean for each one of those samples. We're interested in the distribution of, the, of all of those sample means. The central limit theorem, CLT, tells us three important things about the distribution of these sample means. First, the mean of all of the sample means will be equal to the mean of this original population. The standard deviation of all of these sample means will be the standard deviation of the original population divided by the square root of n. The third fact that the central limit theorem tells us is something about the shape of this distribution of the x-bars. If n is greater than or equal to 30, this distribution is going to be normally distributed. Or, if the original population was normally distributed, this will be normally distributed. So let's mark the position of one standard deviation above the mean and one standard deviation below the mean. The high point of this distribution will be at the mean. And because this is a normal distribution, then the height of the, de of the curve at one standard deviation above and one standard de deviation below will be 60% of that height. The curve is concave down within one standard deviation. And it's concave up outside of one standard deviation. So once we take a sample, we can find the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. As it turns out, most often we will not know what the original standard deviation was of this original distribution. Therefore, we're going to have to approximate this standard deviation with the best information available to us, which is the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n. This is such an important standard deviation that we're going to call it a standard error, SE. In the unusual cases where we might actually know what the original population standard deviation, then we can use a Z distribution as the normalized distribution. On the other hand, if we had to make this approximation, which is almost always, we'll need to use a T distribution. A T distribution looks much like a standard normal distribution, except that the standard deviation is a little bit bigger than one or a minus one. And how much bigger it is depends on the degree of freedom. The degree of freedom is going to be n minus one in this chapter. 
So a t-distribution looks an awfully lot like a standard normal distribution. We will have access to a pt function and a qt function, much like we're, we have access to a p-norm function and a q-norm function if we were working it with a z-distribution. This is the three distribution diagram. We use this diagram differently if we're doing a hypothesis test or if we're doing a confidence interval. We'll look at those situations in separate videos.